What's up everybody, Dean Man back. Welcome to a brand new video and today we're going to be doing another Godzilla vs. Kong news roundup. In this video, I'm going to be doing the back half to the last video. So once we get done with the intro, I'm going to cut back to that guy and he'll take it from there. In this video, we're going to be breaking down information coming from interviews following Godzilla vs. Kong's release. This will give us new context and information into the movie and it's actually pretty cool. I, I had a really fun time looking into this stuff. I don't know why I didn't sooner. So I hope you guys enjoy and then the video will play out normally from there and uh so uh i guess i'll see you guys next time i record a video and you'll see me real soon Now we're getting into some interviews and stuff that happened after the movie, so we'll run through it. Um, I've got links to all this stuff down below if you want to check the full interviews out for yourself. Starting out, KDM, who's a guy you're going to hear a lot about as we go through the next few months of um, Godzilla news. KDM did an interview with Kaylee Hoddle, and it's a really cool interview. In it, she talks about how her career goal is that she wants to help the deaf community grow. That's her goal. Acting is just a way to help that happen, and I think that's really, really noble and very mature of her. She said she'd love to return in the role of Gia, and I, I think think she might be which is exciting so uh, that's always really cool she was such a strong part of Godzilla vs Kong and she is a character that we have so much emotional connection to already it'd be really strange if they didn't bring her back and specifically Kaylee Hoddle as Gia she mentions that Kong wasn't played by an actor in a mocap suit or anything like that at least on set Kong was played by a green wall with some marks on it and laser pointers telling her where to look she said it wasn't as important to her to visualize the Titans as it was for her to just act and perform the way that she was told to so she never took the time to visualize Kong in front of her instead she was just trying to deliver the performance she was told to deliver she loved the whole experience of making films and especially traveling an interview with Adam Wingard explains why there is no post credit scene to Godzilla vs Kong he says they shot one but didn't use it in the movie the post credit scene wasn't setting anything up in particular it was setting up a general direction for the monster verse to head but no particular storylines and they found that it was a better ending for the film than the one they originally had so they decided to use it there as we understand it Godzilla vs. Kong was supposed to end with Kong watching Godzilla swim off into the ocean. After the end credits rolled, we were supposed to see the scene of Kong in the Hollow Earth saying that he's home and then roaring out into the distance as the new king. Adam Wingard said that the way it originally played didn't set anything up, but it was limiting in what they wanted to do, so they wanted to leave the door more open than that. It was up to audiences to decide if they wanted to see more movies, so by not adding a post credit scene, there was no expectation that they had to return. It tied the film up and ended things all together. But by having the ending we had, they did have a general direction for us to move if audiences wanted us to move in that direction that direction being the hollow earth they didn't want to set anything up that was going to limit future filmmakers including themselves on following through on what they had set up so if they had set anything in particular up that would have meant a direct direction for things to head so that would have limited potential whereas if they ended the way they ended it if any other filmmaker but adam wingard steps in they can do whatever they want he said that after the release of godzilla vs kong it was important to take a step back and see what people really liked about the movie Movie, see how they responded to it. That way they could move forward with the aspects that people liked rather than pushing the aspects that people didn't care as much for. They're taking feedback from both fans and critics to see how to deliver the best movie possible rather than just rushing another film into production before this one even comes out. That's an incredibly smart, mature, and I think very um, safe plan for them to take. It avoids problems that we've seen with DC and avoids the problems we're currently seeing with the MCU. In another interview, Wingard talked about Kong's axe. In that interview, he says that the throne room was just a tease and he he hopes to explore its origins later on. He says that there is a real true backstory behind it that he wants to explore on screen. That makes me hope that in the next movie we'll see a war between the Godzilla and the Kongs in the ancient Kong past that shows how the throne room wound up in the state it wound up in at the start of Godzilla vs Kong. That's also a good way to get some more Godzilla and Kong battles on screen without actually having the two fight each other which compromises the ending of the film. Max Bornstein elaborates saying Godzilla's scales have a conductive radioactive quality that was harnessed by the primitive of Kongs. They had an evolved civilization that used simple tools, some made from the spines of a Godzilla creature. He says that there are more like it, which we actually do see in the movie, but the one Kong uses is something like an iconic scepter of a king. I'm assuming this was like the axe. The rest of them were for the other Kongs. Toho Kingdom also did an interview with Adam Wingard. This was done by my friend Chris, so please go check it out down below. It's a very good one. In that interview, Wingard states that he wanted a cameo by James Rolfe, who of course we know from Cinemassacre's Monster Madness, but it was never able to work out. He also 
also explains that using the Ifakube music wouldn't have worked and it wouldn't have been right for him, as he views the MonsterVerse Godzilla as a different character from the Toho's Godzilla. He says that King of the Monsters does a fantastic job at reviving the new score, but it isn't exactly needed for this new version of the character. They wanted something that sounds like the Godzilla theme, but a new version of it. They wanted this to be the MonsterVerse Godzilla theme. You can tell it's Godzilla's theme, but it's not the same. Just like how you can tell he's Godzilla, but he's not the same Godzilla. Although he did pay respects to Ifakube, stating that the soundtrack for Godzilla vs. Destroya was his guiding force when working on the script. He owns up to the controversy, saying that he wanted the soundtrack to be different even though he knew it would upset some fans. He hopes they would warm up to his ideas. He says he never had plans to include Mothra or Rodan in the film, but that he was the one who pushed for the Ghidorah Skull to be included. The King of the Monsters post credit scene was added after the fact to set up Godzilla vs. Kong. Personally, I find that very confusing, as the King of the Monsters scene doesn't really set up Godzilla vs. Kong at all and actually raises more questions than answers. I think we would have all been much more accepting of it if they didn't add that post credit scene, because now we're all going, where's Alan Jonah? Why did they wind up with the skull? There's two skulls? What's going on? But I guess good for them for trying to set that up? He admits that the budget is another consideration. It costs money to add new monsters from Toho, so there's no real point in adding them in if they're only going to be cameos. He also says there just wasn't room in the story he wanted to tell. It wasn't the appropriate place to put in other Toho monsters. He said that when exploring the Hollow Earth, he was excited about making new monsters the way that King of the Monsters did, and felt that adding Toho monsters in the background was needless. I could not agree more. He explained that, if anything, he wants Angiris to cameo, but that ultimately it would be a waste of the character to not do anything interesting with him. He said that Godzilla's victories in the opening brackets are both literal and more wide-spanning. While he may have fought and defeated those monsters between movies, which we actually have seen in the comic books, some of the defeats we see are just simply him conquering them, them bowing to him at the end of the movie. That counts as a defeat. So he didn't exactly need to defeat Behemoth, Methuselah, or the others. They bowed to him, and that counts in and of itself. Wingard shoots down the idea of a director's cut once again, saying his goal was to make a fast-paced, efficient two-hour film. He said his goal was to make dense entertainment. He said he knows people wanted something that had more space to breathe, but for him, he wanted this to be something punchy and fast-paced that covered as much ground as possible in two hours. And I personally think he accomplished that incredibly well. He admits that having two hours of monsters fighting would be super boring, but he still somehow seems very interested in the potential of flipping the amount of monster and human screen time. He says we could watch a movie at some point that has 35% human scenes and the rest of it's all monster scenes and it would still be as compelling. While personally I don't agree, I would have to see how it's done in the execution. He says that if he were to do that movie, it would be a movie with a lot of quiet downtime with the monsters existing in their personal lives just being themselves, communicating through nonverbal language, a lot like what we see at the opening of Godzilla vs. Kong with Kong's morning routine and a lot of the Hollow Earth stuff with Kong exploring his temple and the Hollow Earth itself. Wingard said in early versions of the movie, Godzilla fights Mechagodzilla one-on-one -on -one for a lot longer. It's a much more Godzilla-focused fight, and Godzilla holds his own much better. He said that it doesn't have as much stakes if Godzilla can take on Mechagodzilla evenly, which I agree with. I think that this was the way to do it. Mechagodzilla is perfectly designed to kill Godzilla specifically, even Wingard acknowledges this. Therefore, Mechagodzilla should have an easier time taking out Godzilla than he should have taking out Titans like Kong, for instance. While Mechagodzilla may not be stronger than Godzilla, he's always one step ahead of him. He's programmed to counter Godzilla at every move. Wingard also says that Godzilla's also gone through three, count it, three rounds. I know some people like to say that the Hong Kong round is one fight. It's not. It's two rounds. You need to learn how fighting works. Imagine this is a boxing match. It's one fight with multiple rounds. Have you guys never watched boxing before? Do you only watch kaiju movies? Is that, I don't understand. So yes, he says Godzilla went three rounds with Kong and depleted most of his atomic energy by the time he gets to the Mechagodzilla fight, which is why Mechagodzilla's beam is able to overpower Godzilla's. Had Godzilla not drilled a hole to the center of the earth in one of the wackiest, um, I think dumbest, scenes in Godzilla history, Mechagodzilla's beam would probably not have been able to overpower Godzilla's. Finally, Wingard addresses the question that we've all had, including myself, since the dawn of time, and that is, why don't Godzilla and Kong kiss? In this interview, Wingard does take the time to give, like, I don't know, some real answers about questions that he actually thinks people want to hear about. Like, come on, get to the point. We want, we want to know about the kiss. 
Wingard says he reigned in the violence a bit because he wanted kids to love this movie. He never felt like he was having an issue with censorship because from the start he knew this was supposed to be a fun movie for families. So as a horror director, he didn't feel like he was having to tiptoe around anything. He said he honestly regrets not getting Godzilla and Kong to kiss at least once in fully rendered Hollywood CGI. I'd like to point out right now that at the moment of me making this video, there is another Kong movie in production out, Legendary and Warner Bros, featuring Godzilla. That's Godzilla and Kong back on screen together and I just, we have the chance, we have to take it. Nathan Lind will tell you, this is it. This is this is our one shot. So just do it, just, 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 just do it. You want that kiss to, to mean something and no better build up than an acrimonious relationship when they're fighting and it's an explosion when they finally do kiss. You're like, it's happening. They, you know, they've been fighting and trying to kill each other and now it's that finally happening. So I think that this is like a two hour build up and then the sequel, it's just gonna be love making. He said he did have some scenes of Kong being super goofy, fully rendered out with Kong freaking out with a really goofy expression that he had done for fun. So if he could have that done for fun, he could probably have them kiss uh, as well. No, why don't they kiss? I want them to kiss. <laughs> I think there's a shot where they could have, but they just didn't. It wasn't the right moment for them. I feel like there's a lot of tension there. I could see it. It was on the script, but then, you know, Godzilla's and Kong's agents complain about it. And that's, that, that was the end of it. I think it's because Godzilla doesn't have lips. Finally, he said that just watching the monsters be themselves is almost as enjoyable as seeing them fight, which I actually generally agree with. I, I, I don't love it when Godzilla's just walking. I don't like Godzilla just walking around, but if Godzilla's doing something, that's that's always interesting. And if Kong is doing something, like Kong's morning routine, at least he's doing something. I find that very interesting and engaging. So he said having more quiet moments like the morning routine for Kong is just as interesting for him to explore in future projects as anything else, which is really cool. And then finally, Kong did not stop there in 2021. That's right, Kong made one other official appearance in a Warner Bros. film in 2021, that being in Space Jam A New Legacy. I've heard Space Jam A New Legacy is a real stinker, um, so I'm very excited at some point down the line to check it out just for Kong who I believe has about approximately five seconds of screen time but you know what I'll cherish those five seconds I've never even seen Space Jam the first Space Jam and I'm gonna like I'm gonna I'm gonna but I'm gonna appreciate Space Jam a new legacy unlike all of you haters who just wanted Lola Rabbit to be hot. All right, that'll do it for this one, guys. This one was much longer than I wanted. <laughs> I wanna give a huge thank you to all my patrons on Patreon. These guys keep the channel running, so please consider supporting the Patreon. You can get early access to content, access to the Discord community, and more, and I really appreciate it. Do remember to hit subscribe and um, hit that like button because uh, that makes the videos do better uh, um, in the analytics, uh, which means I get more money. And that's what this is all about, baby. <laughs> all right. Thank you guys all for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you guys next time for the next one. D-Man, out.